Right, if you can please put your hands together for the moment you've all been waiting for, please extend extremely warm welcome to Tim Caulfield, Managing Director of Griffin and King. Um, no pressure there then. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see you all. I hope you're enjoying the event so far. Um, as you probably know, my name's Tim Caulfield. I'm Managing Director of Griffin & King. I'm a Chartered Accountant, Insolvency Practitioner and Law Graduate. After qualifying, I spent around 20 years advising business owners about how to run profitable businesses. And in more recent years, I've specialised in rescue and recovery and debt advice. Griffin and King are specialists in all aspects of business rescue and recovery, including personal and corporate insolvency. We don't do anything else. We don't have an accounts department. We don't have an audit department. We don't have a tax department, and we certainly don't do loans. We get introduced to our clients at a most difficult stage of their lives. Our clients tell us we show empathy, compassion, consideration, and above all, professionalism to guide them through a very difficult period. But don't take my word for that. Have a look at our website and see the testimonials from our clients yourselves. And here's a couple of recent ones. Okay, why are we here today? Most of you either advise business owners or individuals in one capacity or another, or are in business yourselves. This talk will give you a flavour of what we do and how we can help you to help your clients, like we did with Richard and Roger. So that brings me to today's talk, where we'll be covering something every professional advisor should know about and a dog story. Well, this in my view is something every advisor to a company should know about. It's section 216 of the Insolvency Act 1986. How many of you here today have either dealt with or heard about a company that's closed down and then restarted? Everybody in my local pub has, as well as every director I meet. And they've got a story about it. So I'll be very surprised if there's anyone here that hasn't come across this situation. It's not uncommon. And this section deals with the reuse of company names following a formal insolvency. The leading textbook authority says about this section, the conditions for liability are stringently drawn, the penalties draconian, and both criminal and civil liability are automatic. If they are met, the court has no discretion to absolve the defendant or limit his liability. Wow, that's heavy stuff. So, listen carefully, please. So the first part of the talk will go through the rules, the pitfalls and possible solutions of section 216. And the second part of the story is the dog story. Our delegates would like a dog story. That's what I've been told. So this is a story about Bill, his debts, his company, and his dogs. Bill suffered from a serious head injury and couldn't cope with running his company anymore and was under pressure from his personal creditors. His wife had left him because of the calls and the pressure they were under. And this story shows how Griffin and King helped Bill, his wife, and his dogs moved into retirement and saved their house. And the total talk will take about 20 minutes. Okay, so let's turn to section 216. So under section 216, it's an offence for a person who's been a director or a shadow director of a company that has entered insolvent liquidation at any time during the 12 months prior to it going into liquidation to be a director of any company which uses the same or a similar name for a period of five years. Not only is this a criminal offence punishable by up to two years in prison or a fine, 
under section 217, any person acting in contravention of this section can also be personally liable for all of the debts of the successor company. Yes, that's what sections 216 and 217 say. It's so important not to get it wrong. So, if Mr Smith is director of Rapid Enterprises Limited, and that company goes into insolvent liquidation, and then he starts another company, of which he's also director, called Rapid UK Limited, not only is he committing a criminal offence by trading Rapid UK Limited, but in the event of Rapid UK Limited going into a formal insolvency, under sections 216 and 217, he'd be personally liable for all the debts of that successor company, assuming Mr Smith hasn't made use of any of the exceptions that we'll look at later. So what's a similar name? There's no easy definition. It's a name which is so similar to that by which the liquidated company was known in the period of 12 months before it went into liquidation as to suggest an association with the successor company. And it includes any trading names. So if the company Rapid Enterprises Limited went into liquidation, a name such as Rapid Enterprises West Midlands Limited, with or without brackets, would definitely be caught as would Rapid Ventures Limited. The question is, does the name suggest an association with the company that went into liquidation? Even reuse of an informal acronym can create an infringement. So if Rapid Enterprises Limited also uh, traded as RE and that name was used by the successor company, it would be caught. This is someone who is not an appointed director but whose instructions the directors of the company are accustomed to accept and implement. And on the subject of shadow directors, here's a conversation I often have with somebody who comes to see me for my advice and just to make this point, I'm going, just to make the point, I'm going to use Richard uh, with a little bit of role play to, to help make the point. So please step forward, Richard. We, we very, very much, thank you. We very much enjoy our role play. Oh, we do. And, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, and if we can move the slides on a bit, thank you. There we are. That's me in action okay. to can create further, create the mood, and that's uh, yeah, that's. You can, you can recognise the other person as well, can't you? Right. Well, well, of course, this is the first time we've met, isn't it, Richard? Um, so here we go. Are you a director of the company, Richard? Oh, no. Are you a check signatory? Well, yes. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a check signatory because I thought that would be a good idea for me to sign the checks instead of the directors. And I told the directors that. Well, Richard, in that case, there's a very good chance you're actually a director. Really? Well, I, wasn't aware, I wasn't aware of that, Tim. Okay, so nobody told you. Well, thank no, you, Richard. No one told me that. Okay, you can, you can, sit, down now. You can sit down there. Thank you. That's very good of you. Okay. A lot of people will say that a check signatory is automatically a director. That isn't necessarily correct. But whether Richard actually is or isn't a shadow director would depend on all the circumstances of his relationship with the board and how a court would interpret them. It's actually quite easy to be a director without even realising it. Anybody, anybody who is a check signatory and not a director should take legal advice. There's only three exceptions to section 216 and these are given in chapter 22 of part 3 to the insolvency rules. It's where a company acquired, the first of which is where a company acquires the whole or substantially the whole of the business of an insolvent company under arrangements made by the insolvency practitioner. Creditors must be notified and notice of this arrangement must be advertised in the London Gazette. Strict timetables need to be complied with, no later than 28 days after completion, otherwise it just doesn't work. And secondly, where an individual applies for court permission to use the name in question. 
And again, there's a strict timetable for this. Application must be made within seven days of the company going into liquidation. There's no contravention of the Act by that individual for a period of six weeks from the date of the application to the day on which the court disposes of the action, whichever is sooner. And thirdly, the court's permission isn't required where the company has been known by that, that name for, for a whole period of 12 months ending with the date before the liquidated company went into liquidation and hasn't at any time in those 12 months been dormant. These rules apply not only when the similar name of the successor business is used by, the, by a company, but also by a person as a sole trader or in partnership. Under section 217, any person involved in the management of a company that has at any time acted on instructions given by a person whom he knew to be in contravention of section 216 is presumed unless the contrary is shown to have done so willingly and as such can be personally liable for the debts of the company. So watch out any nominee or front man or of course front woman for that matter. How many times have we seen a successor company with Mrs Smith as director but Mr Smith actually running the business and I think in this case it would be very difficult for Mrs Smith to deny any knowledge of all the circumstances of the case. This situation where a company goes into liquidation and then restarts in some form or another is not necessarily scrutinised carefully by the insolvency practitioner. That's not his job. There could be a gap of several months or the director may not entirely know what he wants to do and it's most likely it's the accountant that gets involved with the formation of the new company and it's so easy to foresee how a debt director could fall into the trap of section 216 and be blissfully unaware of the problems. The really important message is to take advice from trusted professionals who know this area of the law and work together. So often a director seems to know someone in the pub who did things in a certain way and everything was okay. The truth is nobody really knows what all the circumstances of that particular case were and it's impossible to make any specific comments. But as far as your clients are concerned, don't take any unnecessary risks and speak to us. Okay, so that concludes uh, a little uh, summary of section 216 and 217. Uh, leave any questions, please, to the end of, uh, of our talks now. So now we're moving on to uh, the dog story. Um, a few months ago, I had a message to call Bill, who's a, com who's a director of a company based in Telford. He'd found our name off the internet and I was told he was very stressed and not easy to understand over the telephone. So I called Bill back and from what I understood, Bill's biggest concern was that he'd been, he was being pressed by his bank for repayment of a personal loan of around £25,000. He also mentioned his company, which was a guardian company. That's one of those companies that provides security personnel to clients' premises for a contractual number of hours, typically overnight. There were debts of the company that couldn't be paid. I asked Bill if he could get to my office to have a meeting. Bill explained that he couldn't drive since his accident. So I thought for a moment and said, OK, let me have your home address and I'll come and see you. So we organised a time and a date, and as I was winding up the conversation, this could well be a wasted trip, Bill interrupted. Are you okay with dogs? He asked. I've got a couple of pups. Well, I didn't give too much thought to Bill's final question until I stood outside his house a few days later, having just knocked. Just a minute, I could hear Bill shouting in between menacing dog barks. It reminded me of those police dogs at away football matches, baying for blood, but at least the police dogs were on leads. Eventually the door opened and Bill appeared. He was around 60, grey-haired and tall. He explained he'd just shut his pups in the sitting room and so long as I wasn't nervous about dogs, I'd be fine. 
Bill introduced me to his pups, and as I'd guessed by now, far from being a, a couple of cute little puppy dogs, Bill had a couple of big ugly brutes. There were a 10 month old German shepherd called Zeus and a two year old Doberman called Tyson. And between them, I guess they weighed in at about 200 pounds, around seven or eight stones a piece. And here they are, that's Zeus. And if you think he's ugly, this is Tyson. Wow, <laughs> he's even uglier. So without being asked, Bill proceeded to put on some protective clothing and demonstrated to me, in his kitchen, how the dogs would treat an intruder. I made the quick mental note, if ever I decided to become a burglar, I'd give Bill's house a miss. <coughs> Bill left me to get to know Zeus and Tyson while he made some coffees. I sat on the settee in Bill's living room and the dogs joined me there, intrigued to see what I'd got in my pockets and briefcase or whether I was going to make a break for it and play the intruder game, which was so much fun. <laughs> Bill carried on talking. He explained he'd had an accident around two years ago when a horse trod on his head. I'm not quite sure how he managed to get his head under a horse's hoof. It sounded a bit careless to me. It certainly didn't sound very pleasant. His cheekbone and face had been completely smashed and he'd been in intensive care for a week. And Bill's face had taken months of surgery to reconstruct. He'd also become muddled and forgetful since the accident, which caused real difficulties to keep his business under control. By the time Bill had explained all this, Zeus and Tyson had got to know me quite well. They were both sitting on on either side of me trying to get as close as possible. Bill had given me some bits of sausage to, sausage to feed to the dogs, which only really made them more excited. I hope they can spot the difference between a finger and a sausage, I thought. Note taking wasn't easy and it went through my mind that by the end of the meeting, me and the dogs would need a bit of surgery ourselves to be separated. Bill carried on explaining about his company he had two employees and three contracts. The company was in arrears with its PAYE and falling further behind. The company records were a mess and Bill really hadn't got a clue about how profitable the contracts were. But Bill's biggest concern were the threatening letters he was receiving from his bank about the personal loan of £25,000 that he'd taken out to finance the business a couple of years ago and that had now fallen into arrears. So cut a long story short, Bill's finances were like this. He'd transferred his interest in the jointly owned property to his wife about three years ago without consideration. If a trustee in bankruptcy was appointed, this is a transaction that could have been challenged. He'd little other income outside of the company. Including the bank loan, his personal creditors were around £35,000. His wife was spending much time away from Bill. She said she didn't want to be with him in his present state. There's a small amount of money available through family sources. So he wrote to the bank and explained the full position. And after a couple of letters, the bank agreed to settle on a full and final settlement of £3,000. Bill couldn't believe it. I had to show him the letter from the bank and go through it with him word by word to convince him. His brother provided the funds, and that at least dealt with the personal debt. So that left the company. Bill was now mostly concerned about his staff and keeping them with jobs. And here's a summary of the company position. So the PAYE, is, PAYE arrears were around £25,000. There were other creditors of £10,000, potential employee liabilities of £20,000, the three contracts were worth £10,000. Debt of monies of around £12,000. And Bill didn't want to continue, but he couldn't anyway. He, he, he clearly just couldn't physically continue. So it was clear the company had to go into liquidation. There was no way the company could survive. But ideally, what we wanted to do was preserve the business, the employments and the contracts. 
which was easier said than done. Fortunately, we know a lot of local businesses, so we spoke to a couple of guarding companies who were both interested in buying the contracts and taking on the staff. And we managed to secure this deal, which is up there already. So we need to go back on that. So the deal we managed to secure was £10,000 for the consideration of the business. The acquiring company took over the contracts on an agreed date so there was continuity of the service and no disruption. The employees were retained, all of their employee rights were transferred under 2P and that meant there were no employee liabilities remaining in the company. The client companies themselves approved the transfer and all of the debtor monies due under the contract were paid around £12,000. And Bill's old company went into liquidation, which meant that all the company liabilities died with it, together with the nightmare of bringing all the accounting records up to date. I told Bill about the need for a formal creditors meeting and we discussed where this would be. Usually we hold these at our office in Warsaw, but to suit Bill, we eventually agreed to have it at his home in Telford. Unfortunately, no creditors attended, which is just as well, because Zeus and Tyson were there, sitting on the settee, which I think would have discouraged any prolonged questioning. About a month later, I popped in to see Bill. Zeus and Tyson were pleased to see me, and Bill was slowly coming to terms with retirement. Bill's wife had moved back home as he, and his employees had settled down in their new jobs. Bill seemed much more relaxed and I felt pleased about the part we'd played. As I was leaving, Bill said he was looking for a good home for Zeus and Tyson. I'm not entirely sure he was joking, but I pretended not to hear. So, what have we looked at in today's talk? Um, We've looked at the technical rules relating to the use of company names following a formal insolvency and how easy it would be for somebody running a small company to fall foul of the law. Insolvency is an area that most professionals don't deal with on a regular basis. It's so important to know who you can contact to get the right specialist advice at the right time and plan together. And we've looked at the story about Bill and his dogs even though I say so myself, I don't think many people in my position would have paid a visit to Bill at his home based on that first telephone conversation when I could hardly understand what Bill was saying. If I hadn't gone over to see Bill, things could have been so different for him. He could have lost his home, he could have lost his wife, he could have lost his dogs, and his company would probably have just stopped trading. And this would have meant that the contracts would have simply been terminated. The employees would have lost their jobs, but there wouldn't have been a formal insolvency procedure to deal with any of their employee entitlements. Bill's got two more operations be between now and Christmas, and we can't help him with those. But where we have helped is what we do at Griffin and King. We've supported Bill through a complicated process at a stressful time and played a massive part in getting Bill's life back on track as best as possible. So, what do I want you to do? Just have a think. Do you know a Bill out there, or a Richard, or a Roger? Do you know anyone like the people we've seen today, and the issues we've seen today, um, or do you think we might be able to help somebody in that position? If you do, please speak to me or one of my colleagues. We're always pleased to have a chat or a meeting without charge to explore options, and I'm sure we can help. What we're trying to avoid is a formal insolvency situation, but the next best thing is a structured, planned insolvency process of which the director or the individual can retain a good element of control. And just before I conclude, I'll ask my colleagues at Griffin and King to briefly stand and make themselves known. Thank you very much, uh, guys. Thank you, Amelia, Emma, Carrie, Seema. Richard, James, Stu, and Paul, uh, and of course Janet, nearly forgot Janet. Um, great, thank you guys, thanks for being here today. And finally, just to prove how far I will go, 
to help. Here I am trying to referee a fair allocation of sausage meat between Zeus and Tyson. Yes, and that's, that's a true recording, that is. Um, okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, uh, over to Martin now. Thank you very much. Questions at the end. Thank you very much. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, it's a graveyard slot. This is the worst ebb of the human spirit, just after lunch, and it's warm and it's dark, and you're looking at presentations. Um, my only saving grace is that you've not had alcohol, apart from one or two hip flasks I saw dashing around earlier, so hopefully you should stay awake. Um, it's interesting to hear the, um, the dog story. Um, when I was going through my aircrew training, I'm a military officer previously in a previous incarnation, one of the things we do is escape and evasion training where we have to dig a scrape in the ground and then survive in that for a couple of days. And um, we dug our scrapes, covered it over, perfectly camouflaged, and then we could hear dogs barking in the distance and we thought, someone's got a recording and they're playing it. And so you started to hear the scurrying around in the bush. And the next thing I knew I was being dragged out of my hole by my foot by something just like Zeus. So incredibly big, powerful dogs, so I can understand that intimidation. Uh, my name is Martin Rhodes and um, it's always useful in these presentations to have a bit of a context of, of who I am and who's talking. Uh, my background is military. I'm a Royal Naval Officer, I was, and I spent 20 years as an aviator. During that time, I hunted Russian submarines, but of course they gave up and ended up uh, alongside Pagliani and let rusting. Um, so I reinvented myself as an engineer. I went into acquisition and communications. I then did a couple of years search and rescue, and anyone that saw my previous talk a couple of years ago, no, Janet, understood that uh, I, I use um, military experiences to teach leadership management skills. So that was a talk on search and rescue. Subsequently, I've left the Royal Navy and I'm now a reservist and I've spent five years as a reservist and my role in the reserves is CIS, Communications Information Systems. Now there'll be a few acronyms here but don't worry too much about them. I won't use them uh, to any great deal uh, and to any great depth but it's just to give you a context of the sort of capacity that you have in your reservists. My role is to look after C4ISR. So that's command and control computers, communications, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. And that's a web of information and enablers that we use in order to fight our military operations. Having left the, uh, the regulars and become a reservist, I did a day job as well, and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to be when I grow up. Uh, this is just winter plumage, so I have a certain amount of growing to do. Um, so I became a bit of an independent consultant, looking at business performance improvement, looking at how people perform in teams and individuals and getting the best out of them. So I've been an executive coach, I worked in defence consulting, I worked in business performance improvements and a number of small ventures. And more recently, I've um, joined a company called Atkins Global as one of their transformation specialists. And we're looking at the MOD and transforming them through following the Levine reports. And as you'll appreciate, anyone has got a knife for security or international security, we're going to have a security and um, well, a defence and security review coming up in the next couple of years, uh, just around about the same time as the, uh, the elections. So it's really important that the MOD is able to, to respond to that. So we're, that's where I apply my talent at the moment. I call this presentation Butlins with Rifles because I went to Afghanistan a number of years ago now, and uh, well, two years ago, and what I found was people didn't really understand what it was like, and the closest I could come to describing it was literally Butlins with Rifles, and you'll come to see that in the near future. Now you will have seen Ross Kemp on television in Afghanistan running around the bush with rifles and, and the, the guys on the ground. That does go on, that is a part of our operation in Afghanistan and has been for the last 10 years or so. But that's not the day-to-day -day events for most people out in, in Afghanistan, particularly in Bastion Camp where I was based. So for the next sort of 15 minutes or so, I'm taking you on a bit of a holiday snap slideshow of <coughs> Afghanistan and my experience of it. And then from there, I'll draw out some leadership lessons which you can apply in your own businesses and for your own personal leadership as well, because leadership is as much about leading yourself as it is, it is about leading your team. So next slide, please. Mobilization. A reservist will mobilize once every five years if there's a conflict going on. That means they will spend nine months away doing something which the Navy requires or the military requires them to do. My particular role is CIS, and we have a tied location in Af Afghanistan, which is the Information Operations, Information Management, and Information Exploitation Officer. That's tied to the Royal Navy and the Royal Navy Reserve, and we've been doing that for, for 10 years. 
and that's the role I undertook out in Afghanistan. Now, being Royal, Royal Navy, we don't have a great deal of experience of land operations. So as a result, there's a significant training overhead. Afghanistan is a thousand miles away from the sea, so it's not really good for someone that's used to bobbing around on a gray ship. So I needed to understand a whole bunch of new training. So they take you through a training program, which is very comprehensive. Uh, my training program really was focused around the military aspects, not the core business, CIS, information management, um, but it, it really focused on the large knowledge gap I would have going from a gray ship onto an orange battle space. So I was taught a weapon, a weapon system, how to use it, how to strip it, how to refit it, when it went wrong, how to fix it, how to load it, how to fire it. And we'll come on to the weapon system in a second. I was taught about mine sweeping. If the helicopter or the aircraft went down or was in a vehicle and we had to get out of the vehicle, IEDs, uh, explosive devices, improvised explosive devices are everywhere. So you need to be able to make sure you clear the ground you're walking on to get to a safe location. So I was trained on that. Language. Not many people speak Arabic or Afghani or Pashtun, so we needed a certain understanding of the language so we could understand what was going on around us. We got language training. Patrolling, working as a team, covering ground. Arrest techniques, holding people. Interrogation techniques, and then just self-protection, force protection, because we always need to protect ourselves first. So it's a very comprehensive training set. And then you spend a week in the bush, in the UK, as bush as it can be, practicing these skills, going around in trucks, breaking contact if the enemy engages you, how you break that, how you find safe space, how you lay down suppressive fire so you can then bring in the actual fighters to do the work for you. It's a very comprehensive training right from the get-go. And then once you finish that, the waiting starts. It's military, so there's always waiting. So we then wait for a medical and dental check. Uh, they check your teeth to make sure you're not gonna have a problem in theater, but also they x-ray them because that's clearly how we identify people if something goes bad. Medical, make sure you're fit and healthy to go. Fitness test, then you get equipped. All of your clothing, all of your equipment, including body armor, helmets, and your rifle. You then zero your rifle to make sure you can hit something at range. Um, and then more waiting. You wait for the transport to get you to Bryce Norton, and then you're in the hands of the RAF. You fly on a commercial airline to a place called Minad in the Middle East, and then you sit in a compound. And that's where the RAF teach the Navy how to wait. They really do know how to keep people waiting. And then eventually, one of these turns up. This is a C-17, around about the same size as a 747. Those of you who have been overseas on a large body aircraft, this is exactly it. You can fit two badminton courts in the back of there. Not when I was there, it was crammed with people and equipment and a palletized toilet set that they throw on there. So you can imagine all of this crammed in for seven and a half hours flying into Afghanistan. Now it's not like a commercial airliner. No mods cons, really hard seats. So seven and a half hours you're feeling a little bit stressed and strained and very tired. And we come in at night, and we come in at night because it's a very big target. No one wants to be shot down in the sky, and this gives a lot of noise, and it's a really big visual footprint. So we fly in at night. And of course, anything at height can be taken out by a surface to air missile. A surface to air missile, when it's launched, takes a certain amount of time to acquire. So if it's at height an aircraft, you're in the air a long time, so this missile can acquire you. So we fly low level. You're still susceptible to small arms fire, rifles, pistols, but it's a smaller opportunity, wind of opportunity to shoot. And of course, a bullet coming through is far less effective in terms of damage than a missile. So you're flying one of these at about four o'clock in the morning, pitch black with all the lights off, flying low levels, swooping through the mountains, over the villages, and then you land on to a pitch black <coughs> runway, and you grab your bags, the doors open, then you run from the aircraft, which is still a big target, into the terminal building. So that's you in Afghanistan. As the door comes down, you've been in an air-conditioned environment, 40 degrees of heat hits you like a brick, and the smell is indescribable. Uh, it's not something I want to describe, but it's not very pleasant. So you're then running across the runway with your rifle and your kit, and you throw it into your bunk for the first night. As you can appreciate, Afghanistan is not a familiar place for most of us coming from the West, and a military base thrown up in the desert is perhaps not have the same level of health and safety that we'd normally have in the UK, and it certainly doesn't have signposts, the roads are all dust, so they don't let you out on your own because you will get lost and you will get injured. So the first night is spent in transit accommodation. Next slide, please. But that's where you get this, your weapon system. The SA-80, A2, Heckler and Koch. It's accurate out to 300 meters as an individual weapon, as a section out of 600 meters. And this particular one has an optic set on the top called a SUSAT. It's designed to give you a three to one magnification, very effective weapon. NATO standard, 
armory and it's held by everyone in the military that goes out to Afghanistan, zero to you. This never leaves you. The insider threat is very serious in Afghanistan, particularly in Bastion and any of the large camps. We were fortunate that we never had an insider attack in Bastion, however, it was a constant threat. So this goes with you to the bed, to the gym. It's outside your shower in the bathroom. It's outside your cubicle in the toilet. It goes everywhere with you. You're never away more than a hand's reach away from it. I was fortunate I had this and a pistol, so I could put this in a rack and still had a firearm with me, but it never leaves your sight. Same with your body armor. Your body armor is never further away then you can reach it and put it on because indirect fires, missiles and rockets coming in was a very real danger. Next slide, please. Then you get to go to bed. This is my accommodation for six months. Um, quite austere. It's a, a large outer tent, which is air-conditioned and heated to a degree in a style. Um, it's Afghanistan, so your air conditioners aren't going to work well at 40 degree heat in the dust, and they don't heat very well either. So this is a little pod with a click-click bed and a duvet and a pillow. So that was day one, and it was also day 185. So that was my home. Um, not everyone has such austere accommodation, but early on you don't get the opportunity to sort of spruce it up. But the girls seem to have an amazing ability to, to nest. Next slide, please. This was um, a colleague of mine. Um, as you can see, significantly different. <laughs> um, you can still see the, uh, the weapon system, the body armor and helmet close by. Uh, beautiful duvet. You can see underneath some running shoes, power board. Uh, slippers, I think you'll find just down here. Um, so, yeah, as you can see, you can make austere conditions comfortable, more comfortable than they were. And that's an interesting learning point. No matter where you go, people will always try and build an environment they're comfortable with and they're familiar with. This doesn't look like an Afghan tent. This looks like a teenager's bedroom, doesn't it? Uh, no, it's too, too neat and tidy for that. But you can appreciate, you know, people try and create an environment around them that is familiar. So if you are bringing on new employees, Always remember, they will try and create a, a space, a workspace or a working environment that they're familiar with, which may clash with your culture. So just be aware of that. You need to bring people in and acclimatize them to that environment. So, 180 odd days in a, an accommodation like that. Next slide, please, Jared. That's my first day at work. Um, this is GIFSIS, Joint Force Command Information Systems Headquarters. Uh, that's me in the center and my team around me. It's remarkably similar to an office you'd get in the UK. Uh, and that was the uh, amazing thing for me. It wasn't that significantly different from what I would have done in, uh, in a UK headquarters. Uh, computers all over the place, and that, as I mentioned, information is critical to what we do. So managing that information was very much about my, my job. I looked after the information management and information exploitation for the coalition right across Afghanistan as centered at Bastion. So there were places like Kabul, where there was more information managers just like me, but I set the policy and I policed the procedures and governance for everything out in Helmand province. With, not just on my own, but with a team. On my left is um, a warrant officer, Mark. He, um, he's RAF. Now the RAF have been consolidating a lot of their groups. So you can imagine being an information specialist. I would expect an information specialist as my left hand man in this case. Um, what the RF have done is taken their communicators, their information and computer specialists, their application specialists, and their riggers, the guys that build antennas and radios, and consolidate them into one trade group. So imagine what guy I got on my left-hand side to help me manage information across Afghanistan. Yes, a guy that builds antennas. So he had no idea about applications, no idea about SharePoint, information flows, network systems, computers, uh, routers, and servers. So that was a bit of a learning curve. But fortunately, as a warrant officer, he had management skills. So if you don't get what you need, you take the strengths of the individual. So I gave him a team of application specialists, Royal Signal uh, engineers, who are there trained to work on SharePoint, work on uh, all of the applications we use in theater. Some of them are just Word and Office type tools. Others are very specialist intelligence gathering tools. And they, they were fully trained. So he managed that team. He also was my policeman. Because he's a warrant officer, he carries with him a very big set of boots, which he can kick people with very hard. If it gets to my desk level, things have gone wrong. If I keep it at his level, then it's controlled, just like a, a regimental sergeant major would control a team. It's a very, very capable guy. Behind me is my information assurance specialist. He was a policeman, a Royal Military policeman, with a specialism in cyber security, which is perfect for me. We had an application system running across the network so that if anyone played with information they weren't supposed to, or they plug something in that they weren't supposed to, it was alerted to him. So every morning, part of my battle routine was to get the information assurance update. And it's amazing. Tim, can I just pull this off here? Would you mind? Um, 
these are prolific in theatre. iPads, application tablets, uh, phones, mobile phones, iPods, and they need to charge. So you can plug these into any computer through a USB and they charge up. The problem is, my network is mission secret, so it's NATO secret information, almost top secret. So the second you plug one of these in, even though you're only charging it, it actually becomes a secret piece of equipment. It's contaminated by an information flow because we can't govern what goes on to here. As a result, anyone that plugged one of those in lost it, confiscated by my Royal Military Policeman. Held for 30 years because that's the endurance of the information. That's how long it stays secret for. Um, so there'll be a whole bunch of very new <laughs> iPads coming out of the MOD from my tour because I, I confiscated like 235 of these. Um, and that's just the UK. The Americans are far more draconian. Um, what they do is they take one of these and they take it straight across to the wall and they get a nail and a hammer and they bang it in. So as you walk into the American compound, you can see on the side of the wall, iPads, iPods, mobile phones, all nailed to the floor, all nailed to the wall because they've been confiscated and they've been deemed as secret. So, yeah, I thought I was very lenient. Uh, so in about 30 years' time, there'll be a whole bunch of these hitting, the, uh, hitting eBay as heirlooms. So uh, get yourself an old iPod. So that was the office. Um, my team around me, this is the, the operations and planning team. And then I have another prefab next to me, which wasn't owned by me. It was owned by the um, sort of the, what we call the J3, the operations guys. These were the guys running the network. As you can appreciate, Afghanistan doesn't have a complete GSM mobile phone network. It doesn't have a BT laying cable in the ground. What we have are radios and satellites. And these guys kept the plates spinning on the radios and satellites. So that was my team. Next slide, please, John. Um, this is how it became more austere. My application specialists all had specialist um, equipment, and this is the tents they were in. So despite running a 21st century battle, we're in a third world country, essentially, in terms of capability, no infrastructure. So this is a tent with basically desks on the ground and various applications. The, the system at the front is called Bowman. That's our land communication system. Provides mapping, provides email, some texting, and it also has a telephone for voice over IP communications. Uh, Bowman, B-O-W-M-A-N. It's not a very good system, or it didn't used to be. It's improved significantly, but it became known as better, uh, better with a map and a Nokia. So Bowman, that was the, yeah, because that's what it was. It was a very poor system, significantly improved, but my application specialists had to get these communicating right across Afghanistan. So quite a challenging section. Next slide, please, John. So my day. We have a battle rhythm. This is how we run our week. We run out of Mondays and Fridays and Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's all numbers. So we start any day with breakfast. 0600, that's when the galley opens. Oh, the defect, it was called by the army. Most people are out running at that stage. They run, they shower, they run with a rifle, they shower with their rifle, they then get into green uniform, and you saw me one previously, and then they uh, have breakfast. The food there was absolutely fabulous while I was there, but as we were coming to the end of my tour, Herrick 17, we were starting to withdraw some of our assets because we have to be out by the end of this year. As a result, food quality started to drop off. Not for me, though. Hurrah. Um, so, breakfast, and then we turn to at 8 o'clock. We turn to at 8 because that's a normal working day for us. Um, the UK, of course, is still in bed. They don't get out of bed until a couple of hours later, and they don't come to the office until about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock my time in Afghanistan. So I've got four hours of working before PGHQ, Permanent Joint Headquarters, wakes up. So between 8 and 8.30, I have to sort my life out, sort out what's gone over overnight. I do have a duty officer running overnight, um, but um, to be honest, he doesn't really know my business. He's just about keeping the networks up and running. So my day was, um, was quite, quite interesting, quite challenging. I'd start by looking at the, the emails. What had come in? What problems had we encountered that night? Um, if there was nothing there, then I'd look at the drive space. As you can appreciate, lots of people are talking all the time in military operations. Email flows, communications flows, plans are passed around, reports come back, surveillance is undertaken. We've got video footage going on, various towers. That whole has to be coordinated. I only have a certain amount of drive space. It's not as if I'm in the UK, I can just go down to PC World and buy some more. I have to be very stringent about what I use and what I keep. So it's about monitoring the space on a, on a computer system. Most people use Windows. Windows needs a headroom of about 30% of its drive space. And I was constantly running at about 10 to 15%. So having to move information around to make sure the systems continue to work. Very, very difficult. Um, any breaches overnight? Any iPads I needed to nail to the wall? Um, any, um, any backups that didn't run? Because the information needs to be available. People, 
people generally don't treat information very well. They'll delete it and they'll say, oh, I need it back. Oh, can I have? So I had a process by which I was constantly looking at backup information. And backups, are not just for the people in theater, Freedom of Information Act, coroners, operational analysis, long time downstream, this information needs to be drawn back so that we can fight a battle in the, um, the Court of Human Rights or in The Hague. So this information is very critical. Um, breakages, things would break. Um, the information assurance piece, if we'd lost data, and also making sure that the Queen's secrets remain secret. Because although we're all part of a coalition, we're all friendly, we're all fighting the same enemy, we may be at war or in tension with some of those other nations in the future. So they're constantly probing my network, and I suspect, not my section, that we were constantly probing theirs to make sure that we were protecting ourselves and knowing the secrets of others. It's one of those things we just need to be aware of. And then we prep for the briefing. Uh, the briefing was very short and sharp. We all did sit down, which was unusual, because most briefings I have with the military, you're on your feet, because if people sit down, they relax. If you're on your feet, it's very, very focused. But this was a run-through of all of the network, any problems we've had, uh, including satellite communications back to the UK. So that was my battle rhythm for the day. Lunch, good quality food, and every lunch they have a different menu, and it would be on a routine. So it was Meatball Friday was my favourite. So it was the um, IKEA meatballs being served up with various different sources. And being Afghanistan and having lots of uh, internationals there, every day had a curry, if you fancied a curry. And one of the, my team had a challenge that he was going to eat a curry for every day. And um, yeah, he was an unwell chap. Uh, Sunday was Commander's Weekly Brief. That was a uh, torture because we'd uh, clean our desks and then from 1 o'clock till about 5 o'clock it would be a complete brief of everything that's gone previously and everything going ahead. And then Wednesday, a visual telecommunications conference with PJHQ. That's where we get our updates of orders. And then Thursday we'd have an engineering brief. What was broken? What could we fix? And there was another one that came along later. The network was getting quite old and quite tired, so I was responsible for replenishing the network, something called OpJana. And that new network has become the core for what we'll use for all our contingency operations. I'd also have duties, not just um, doing the day-to-day -day job. I would either be a, a network commander overnight, looking after the network, making sure everyone was going, or I'd be a tower commander doing force protection. Next slide, please, Janet. So we'd also try and break down some of our stress with the gym. It's interesting to note that people perform really well when they get some of their stress out of their systems. Fitness is a key element to the military because we have to be available, ready to act. So I ran a spinning class three times a week. This is my application specialist. Everyone a Royal Signaler, apart from this last on the end. She's a nurse, and I had a whole bunch of nurses come along to the class as well. So it was quite good for inter-system inter and inter-branch communication. I think the guys liked having nurses around as well. But we had 35% of injuries in the Roll 3 were caused by fizz. Not by being shot at, not by accidents, by fizz. If you ever come across the insanity late at night, if you're flicking through the channels, insanity fizz, uh, where you do sort of three minutes of exercise, 30 seconds break, people were breaking. They go out to theatre, they think, oh great, six months, I'll really get fit. You know, op massive, they'll all come back like Schwarzenegger. Not some of the girls, but some of them. Um, and then injuries, 35% of injuries were fitness related. But it's important to get, bring down the stress level. And we played together as well, and that's an important thing. My team worked really hard, long hours, trying to keep the plates of the network spinning but we played hard as well, as much as you can in Afghanistan, being a dry country. Next slide, please, Janet. It's a national responsibility, my role, so you need to get out and see the world. And of course, you can't just stick your hand out, grab a train, grab a cab. This is the only cab we could grab. This is the uh, Merlin Mark III. Uh, very capable aircraft. I flew these when they were gray and used to hunt Russian submarines. This was the Army version, or the RAF version, which has a ramp on the back and was used for traveling around with people. Uh, and I'd fly from here to places like Kandahar, to uh, Kabul, uh, and to Lashkagar, which you've possibly heard on the news. Next slide, please, Janet. Great aircraft, but of course, it's going to be shot at because it's slow moving, low flying, so we need to be able to protect ourselves. Uh, so there was always a cabin gunner at the front, and on the Chinook, you'd have one front and one back, with a, in this case, a GPMG, uh, which we're all trained on as well. Uh, 7.60 millimeter rounds, and it, it will, you know, it's nasty, scratch you and everything, those things. Uh, so. We do look after ourselves when we're flying around, but this is the most risky part of driving around or flying around in Afghanistan, unless you're in Kabul, in which case it was going around by vehicle. Next slide, please, Janet. What I did notice, though, was absolute fabulous contrast. As you can see, you've got a beautiful little blue building. They're very house-proud, the Afghans. They like their compounds. 
and they like their space. But this is what you, you have to deal with. You know, we have to patrol this space. Dusty, noisy, dirty, smelly, no water, um, animals, feral animals all over the place. So we had to patrol this on a regular basis. And I had to make sure people communicating this environment. But a beautiful place to look at. When you're at heights and you get some context and perspective on it, absolutely gorgeous. But this is what we trained for. Next slide, please, Janet. And this is a training slide. Um, you can tell the difference here with the weapon. It's got a blank firing attachment on the front, the yellow piece. It stops any sort of debris and, and uh, stuff coming out, but also forces gas to make the weapon cock properly. And it doesn't have an optic. But this is how we train. This is my training team in Cyprus this year, actually. Um, as you can see, it's a very similar environment we train in. So we're not suddenly shocked by what we see. We train as we mean to fight. Next slide, please, Janet. Um, and this is me in a tower as a tower commander. A team of four, including myself, uh, two on, two off, two hours working, two hours sleeping, managing the fence line. About four weeks before I arrived, we had the Battle of uh, Bastion, where some insurgents had got some American clothing off the internet, uh, breached the fence, and then were running around shooting our guys. And it took us eight hours to try and find them because they were running around in our kit, which they got off eBay. So yeah, as you can imagine, it's a bit of a challenge for us. Um, so quite stark, but beautiful, very clean and surprisingly, not much rubbish around. You'll see one or two bits and pieces, but we brought that. Next slide, please, Janet. And of an evening, can be really quite beautiful. Uh, nice lagoon there, a little bit more on that in a second, but you can see quite a picturesque sort of landscape. Beautiful sunsets, absolutely beautiful. And then so little light pollution, you could see every star. Next slide, please. Uh, unfortunately, that lagoon is that lagoon. Um, 10,000 people at Bastion, they all need the bathroom. That creates a lot of water and a lot of waste. That's where it goes. <laughs> and my tower was overlooking that, so I only did it for three months. Uh, on a, it wasn't every night. It was every, every couple of weeks, you'd spend a night on there. So as you can imagine, being downwind from that was not the most appealing. But apparently, I read an article that it's good for your immune system. So. Um, and interestingly, that drains downhill to a village, and they're using it for their, um, their fertilizer. And they're having some really good crops down there. So uh, the locals love us. <laughs> Uh, and monitoring pattern of life is another source of information which we have to capture because guy drives to work, drives home. Guy drives to work, drives home. Guy drives to work, stays there. We know something's different. So we monitor that pattern of life to see if he's digging in bombs for the next day. Next slide, please, Jen. Um, tonight's a full moon, and it's nostalgic, really, because every full moon, we had the full moon 5K. One of the local groups that do combat search and rescue, the Pedros, would fly an aircraft not dissimilar to the Merlin, uh, it's a, a, a Seahawk uh, or Black Hawk, and they would have a, a combat medical technician on board. He would fly out to a battle space and he would rescue the guy no matter what, get him into the back of the aircraft, do the emergency medical on him and fly back. And they had a lot of fallen heroes, not the guys that they were picking up, but the guys leaping out of the back of the helicopters. They were on ropes and stuff, but they weren't just suicidal and throwing themselves out. But they did get a lot of injuries and lost a lot of comrades. So they had a charity. And this funded the charity. And it was a five mile, sorry, 5K around their compound. And it was like a rave. It was fabulous. People not under the influence of alcohol or any other substance, having a really good time, music, fires going, just running for a charity. Phenomenal. Next slide, please, John. Christmas was an interesting challenge. Uh, we could get sort of trees sent out. Um, very austere. We managed to get an extra half an hour in bed, which is beautiful, a little bit of a lie-in. But as you can see, ubiquitous body armor and helmet there as well. And we did have a sort of secret Santa, which uh, you buy presents for people that you know and like. Or, next slide please, no one dislike. This was the chief of staff. No one likes a chief of staff. He's the nasty bugger in the room. Um, and this guy was particularly difficult to get on with. He had a certain way of doing things and he wasn't at all flexible. Very much a micromanager. And it's an interesting um, thing to note psychologically. If you're under stress and you feel like things are out of control, you will control those things you can. And it tends to be your staff. So this guy has a, had a real problem controlling his staff. And he was on them all the time. Um, so as a result, we, uh, we decorated his desk and he was most grumpy. In fact, his desk, he always loved his drawers closed. It's a little thing, isn't it? Little things that people get. Drawers had to be closed. So we rigged his drawer so it couldn't possibly be closed. We put a, actually drilled a hole, put a screw in so that dink, dink, drove him mad. Results. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, we did have, um, once a month, a barbecue. It said, work hard, play hard. The food was fabulous, and they would provide us with steaks, so we'd, uh, we'd burn a few steaks. It's a, it's a blurry photograph because, um, well, it was probably moving at the time, but it's not very bright. Those lights 
stand out very much because they are a, they were contrast, but the whole base was very subdued lighting, makes it less easy to target. Um, and talking about targeting, we, we did have some what we call indirect fires, rockets coming in, and um, it's amazing how desensitized you become to that. Uh, they were fired at, from 16 kilometers away, and what they'd done, uh, the Taliban had set up a wall, they built a wall, beautiful wall, uh, with rails stacked up at 45 degrees. They put rockets in there and just covered them over, and then a guy walked along with a car battery and just went, ignite, 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 and these things just fired off, no real guidance, but they were just coming in from 16 kilometers, and then they'd sort of fall in a sort of staggered heap. Uh, a couple hit the airfield, uh, a couple of tents were hit, but no one was injured, and then the rest were just scattered across um, dust. So it's amazing how desensitized you become to that. Uh, and of course, firearms are going off all the time, people are on the ranges, uh, people are practicing, and then anything coming in needs to be taken out in flight. So if we've got a radar scan of a missile coming in, then we'd have our own rockets to intercept, and of course it'll be our own indirect fires, our, our own um, artillery will be firing out at the enemy as well. So the number of bangs all of the time, it's amazing, it's like trains coming past your bedroom, so often you don't, you don't hear them, you know, you sleep right through. Next slide please, Janet. Uh, we do have um, time off. This is my nurses, my girls. They would be in my spinning class. Uh, and this is the NAFI. Talked about creating a world you recognize to make you feel comfortable. So milkshakes, pizzas, um, sunscreen, very important. All of the, the, the home comforts. Well, you saw the girls' uh, bunk space, lights, uh, slippers. Um, so everything you normally need just to keep yourself comfortable. Magazines, cans of Coke. Uh, we create a world that we, uh, we feel comfortable in, despite where we are. And you can see weapon systems all over the place, never out of arm's reach. Next slide, please. Retail therapy. Um, there are business opportunities everywhere, trust me. Um, this was one of the, the many sort of uh, local shops. This was uh, Bastion II, where we were based. And there were three or four of these. Um, everyone was your best friend. Everyone would give you the best deal. Uh, it's amazing what you could get in there. A lot of it, uh, obviously, knockoff stuff. Uh, and um, very cheap, wouldn't last for very long, but it's something that makes you feel like you're home, you're shopping. You had to buy gifts for people at home and you could ship those out. You'd also have to make sure that you had a secret centre. Ukuleles were very popular actually, lots of ukuleles in there, strangely. Um, chess sets, carved chess sets, a lot of Chinese stuff would come in and be sold there. There was some good stuff, good quality stuff. Um, if you got to know the locals, there were some good gemstones being de dealt around, completely legally, um, but because where they are, close to India. A lot of gemstones would come to us quite cheaply. You could sell them back on the UK market for a profit. A number of people did that. Uh, carpets, Persian carpets, phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And you could just get ship them back. So there were some advantages of being out there. Uh, and um, executive coach, four of the guys I worked with were all thinking about going outside and looking for other opportunities. So I had four, four coaching opportunities there. Each one has now gone out into a successful career. So if I'd been able to charge for it, bonus, unfortunately, no. But there are business opportunities everywhere, no matter where you go. Next slide, please, Janet. And this is me towards the end of my tour. Um, the coffee table there is a reel for um, optical fiber. <laughs> Make and mend. It became a really good coffee table, and that's just outside my commander's office. The guy on the right, Stu, uh, Stu Sweetlove, um, RAF, he's another one I coached. He's just about to go outside now, and he's got himself a fabulous NATO job. Um, so opportunities everywhere. And that was just, just saying goodbye as we... Uh, We'd handed over, for a comprehensive handover of about a week. The new guy coming in was very, very capable. I worked for HP and Fujitsu on the, our information infrastructure. So my handover period was very, very relaxed. And then flying back to the UK. Next slide, please, Jan. So what did I learn? People have an amazing capacity. You give them space, they will impress you. We were working 13, 14, 15 hour days there. Some very complex situations, chaos, Danger, constant danger, uh, and yet people, they, they throve. They really did get on with things. So don't underestimate your people. If you've got a team, find out what makes them tick, as you, you are the leader of the, that team. Find out what really engages them and engage them on that topic. They will impress you. Training is critical. We've had a, recently, we've had a bit of a, an economic downturn and people cut off training. I would say that no one in the military would ever turn down training. We know that is our winning advantage. That is our force multiplier. If you can afford training, I would say you can't afford not to train. The difference between a winner and a loser in a horse race is often a nose, but that nose is caused and given that advantage by training. So never turn down training if you get the opportunity and offer it to your staff. 
That's how you get your winning advantage. Look around at various companies. They all offer very similar quality, very similar experience, very similar people. So what is your USP? Well, you can only compete on price unless they are literally world leading. And for us, training was critical because it was often the difference between life and death. As a leader, be clear on what you want and then get out of your team's way. Most of the problems I engaged in theater are the same as the problems I engage in the commercial world. It's people not being clear what they want. It's a vague idea of where you want to be. If you remember the, um, the speech by, I can't remember the name of the American president now, JFK, we will have a man on the moon and return safely by the end of the, the decade. Very clear statement, everyone knew what needed to be achieved. That level of clarity is really compelling. It's a bold leadership decision, but he got out of his team's way as a result of that. But it was very clear what needed to be done, and then people sought the problem. So be very clear about what you want. And remember, as leaders, the, the idea, the good idea of a leader is often a direction to everyone else. A CEO of a company will walk around and think, oh, wouldn't it be good if? And then a sentence follows, and people take that as direction. And the next thing you know, the world is, just as the CEO said. So be aware of what you're, what you're saying as carries soon as amount of gravitas. It directs people, so be very clear about what you want. Information. Information management is a force multiplier. It was for me. Knowing what was going on gave me advantage significantly over the Taliban. So much so that I had a, a particular guy being shot at while he was fixing a tower. I knew where the, this surgeon was, and we could have taken him out, but we decided not to because he was low threat to the guy on the tower, and if we'd have killed him, three of his friends would have come out and played. So having that information allows us to make those decisions. And the day of big data, you will find trends, leads, um, preemptive information, understand your information, make sure you know what's going on. And then finally, work hard together, but play hard together. That's how you build the teams that achieve incredible things.